Welcome back everyone and we are in the final part of today's lesson. We are in the theme globalization, um, looking at how we do go about global marketing and we are finishing off the learning unit where we look at how we are entering the global market. We started looking at the six important questions that we need to answer before we decide. And in this lesson, we are going to have a look at the final three. The decisions, decisions that we are going to evaluate here or discuss here will be deciding how to enter the market, deciding on the global marketing program that we will follow, and then finally deciding on the global marketing organization. Let's start off and have a look at how we are going to decide how to enter the market. When we are looking at a way to enter the market, and we call these market entry strategies, there are a number of things that we can do. We can basically divide these strategies into three areas, which is exporting, joint venturing and direct investment. You are going to watch a separate lecture on this section specifically, but just to put everything in perspective, exporting includes indirect and direct exporting. Joint venturing includes licensing, contract manufacturing, management contracting, or joint ownership. And direct investment is when the company goes and builds their own facilities in the foreign country. So you will be watching a separate lecture on this section. Next, we are having a look at uh, deciding on the global marketing program that we will be following. Companies that operate in more than one foreign market must decide how much, if at all, to adapt their marketing strategies and programs to local conditions. Now, at the one extreme are companies that use standardized global marketing. So essentially using the same marketing strategy approach and marketing mix worldwide. At the other extreme is the adapted global marketing. In this case, the producer adjusts the marketing strategy and mix elements to each target, targeted market, so to each country, resulting in more costs, but hopefully producing a larger market share and return of going into that country. The question of whether to adapt or to standardize in the marketing strategy and program has been much debated over many years. On the one hand, some global marketers believe that technology is making the world a smaller place and consumer needs around the world are becoming more similar. And this paves the way for global brands and standardized global marketing. So global branding and standardization in turn results in greater brand power and reduces the cost, which leads to economies of scale. On the other hand, the marketing concept holds that marketing programs will be more engaging if tailored to the unique needs of each of the targeted groups. So if the concept applies within a country, it should apply even more across international markets. Despite global convergence and consumers in different countries still having widely varied cultural backgrounds, they still differ significantly in their needs and wants. Their spending power is different, their product preferences are different, and their shopping patterns are different. And because these differences are so hard to change, most marketers today adapt their products, their prices, their channels, and their promotions to fit the consumer's desire in each of the different countries. However, global standardization is not uh, an all or nothing position. It's a matter of degree. And most international marketers suggest that a company should think globally, but act locally. So they should seek a balance between standardization and adaption, leveraging the global brand recognition, but adapting their marketing, their products and their operations to that specific market. 
when we are talking about adapting strategies for international markets, we will be adapting the four P's in essence. Now, there are five strategies that are used for adapting um, this approach uh, when we are looking at the product, for example, and two of them lie in the P, uh, the product P, and the other two lie in the promotions P, and we are going to have a look at these strategies starting with the product. Looking at the product um, strategies, for adaption, the first one is your straight product extension. And this means that marketing a product in a foreign market without making any significant changes to the product. So top management basically tells their marketing people, take the product and go and find a market for it. Product adaption on the other side means that it involves changing the product to meet the local requirements or conditions or wants. And this was, for example, in the United States, Dunkin' Donuts sells good old glazed powered jelly cream filled chocolate covered donuts on the go to customers in the morning. But in South Korea, however, you'll find an olive oil or a Topeka starch donut um, in China, Dunkin' Donuts serves their donuts covered in mango pudding or green tea. So they have completely adapted their product. And then product invention consists of the creation of something new to meet the needs of the consumers in that given country. So as markets have gone global, companies ranging from appliances, manufacturers, car makers, candy and soft drink producers have all developed products that meet special purchasing needs of low income consumers when they are going into developing economies. Let's look at how we have to adapt the promotion or how we can adapt promotion when we enter a foreign market. Companies can either adopt the same communication strategy they use in their home market, or they can change it for each local market. Now consider advertising messages. Some global companies use a standard advertising theme around the world. Of course, even in highly standardized communication campaigns, some adjustments might be required for language and cultural differences. Global companies often have difficulty crossing the language barriers with results ranging from mild embarrassment to outright failure. Seemingly innocent brand names and advertising phrases can take on unintended or hidden meanings when translated into other languages. Rather than standardizing the advertising globally, other companies follow a strategy of communication adaption fully adapting the advertising ma message to the local market they're dealing with. Media also needs to be adapted internationally because media availability and regulations vary from country to country. So TV advertising time is very limited in Europe. For instance, ranging from four hours a day in France to none in the Scandinavian countries. Advertisers must buy um, a time months in advance, and they have very little control over the airing times. However, mobile phone ads are much more widely accepted in Europe and Asia than in the United States. And magazines also vary in effectiveness depending on countries. Let's talk about adapting the price when we go into international markets. When we're talking about price, there are a number of things that companies can do. They can just decide to set their prices internationally and to keep it the same. For example, a hardware or a power tool manufacturer that sets a uniform price globally, but this could lead to very high prices uh, in poorer countries and not the price not being high enough in richer countries. 
It could also charge consumers in each country that they do business what they could actually bear. But this strategy ignores the differences in actual cost from country to country. And finally, the company could use a standard markup for each of its um, products. Um, so in each country, they will take the price and have a, add the 30% if that's what it is. Um, but again, these approaches might lead to the cost just being too high for some of the markets to deal with. Regardless of how companies go about pricing their products, their foreign prices probably will be higher than their domestic prices for um, comparable products. An Apple iPad Pro that sells for $7.99 in the United States might go for $9.99 in the United Kingdom. Now, why does that happen? Um, Apple faces some pricing escalation problems. So it must add costs for transportation, tariffs, import margins, wholesale margins, retail margins to its factory pricing. And depending on all these added costs, a product may have to sell for two to five times as much in another country um, to make the same profit as it, than it does in its own country. So to overcome this problem when selling to less affluent consumers in developing countries, many companies make similar or smaller versions of their products that can be sold at a lower price. Now, others have introduced new or more affordable brands for global markets. For example, Lenovo uh, Motorola division developed a, a very modestly priced Moto G smartphone. And although it's not a flashy high tech gadget, um, at, at the latest full function variation of this device sells for as little as $197 in the United States with no contract. So Motorola first introduced the phone in Brazil and one of the largest and fastest growing emerging markets and then in other parts of South America, the Middle East, India and Asia. And in, intended primarily for the emerging markets where consumers want low cost phones, the Moto G may also sell well to cost conscious consumers in major developing markets, such as the United States and Europe. And lastly, let's have a look at place or the distribution part of the marketing mix. When we are looking at how to adapt our distribution channels in the marketing mix, it is very important to understand what a whole channel view is. And a whole channel view is defined as designing international channels that take into account the entire global supply chain and marketing channels, forging an effective global value delivery network. Now let's look at how this global distribution channel would work. Now an international uh, company must take this whole channel view of the problem of distribution uh, of the products and to get the products to the final consumer and then find the links between them and the consumer. And there are two major links between the seller and the final buyer. Now, the first part of this of of the journey in the first link here is channels between nations. And this is where the company moves the product from where it was produced to the borders of countries within which they are sold. The second link is the channels within the nations where the products are moved from where they've entered into the country to the final consumer. So the shelf where they will be bought. Channels of distribution within countries vary greatly from nation to nation. There are large differences in the number and the types of intermediaries serving each country and each market and in the transportation infrastructure and services that is available for intermediaries to use. 
The final major decision that has to be made is deciding on the global marketing organization. Companies manage their international marketing activities in at least three different ways. Most companies first organize an export department, then they create an international division, and finally they become a global organization. Now a firm normally gets into international marketing by simply shipping out the stuff that they make, the goods. If its international sales expands, the company will start and establish an export department with a sales manager and a few assistants. And as the sales increase and the export department can expand into uh, to include various marketing services so that it can actively go after business globally. Um, if the firm moves into joint ventures or direct investment, the export department will no longer be enough, they will not be able to handle um, the load anymore. And many companies get involved in several international markets and ventures. A company may export to one country, license to another and have a joint ownership venture in a third and owning a subsidiary in a fourth. So sooner or later, it will have to create an international division or a um, subsidiary section to handle the international activities. International division, divisions are also organized in a variety of ways. An international division's corporate staff consists of marketing, manufacturing, research, finance, planning, and personnel specialists. It plans and provides for services to various operating units, which it can be organized in, um, and it can be organized in one of three ways. They can go the geographical organizations, which country managers who are responsible for salespeople, sales branches, distributors, and licensees in their respective countries. Or they can operate in units that can be um, grouped by world product groups, so each responsible for worldwide sales of a specific product. And then finally, operating units can be inter, um, internationalized subsidiaries. So each responsible for their own sales and their own prof pro uh, profits in that country. Today, major companies must become more global if they hope to compete. As foreign companies successfully invade their domestic markets, companies must move more aggressively into foreign markets. They will have to change from companies that treat their international operations as secondary to companies that view the entire world as a single borderless market. This brings us to the end of the uh, learning unit on global marketing. In the final session, we have looked at the last three very important decisions that you have to consider before you enter into a global market. Um, I'm hoping that you enjoyed the video examples. Please make sure that you have watched the, the additional lessons as they have been indicated. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next week and enjoy your activity.